good afternoon, whatever the case may be, and welcome from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Shana Carney, and I'd like you to welcome, to welcome you to the last in our mini webinar series um, held in partnership with USGS. This series is part of the Landscape Conservation Cooperatives and Partners Project Outreach Strategy. Let's go ahead and get started. Sean, would you like to start us off? Yes, thanks very much, Shana. This is Sean Finn. I'm Science Coordinator for the Great Northern LCC, uh, one of the principal investigators of the Integrated Data Management Network uh, Project. The IDMN, as we'll call it from now on, uh, involved over 20 partner organizations from across the United States, uh, including 50 or more than 50 uh, investigators that contributed to some element uh, of the uh, IDMN and, and some uh, perhaps more than one element. Uh, the project's been over two years in the making. Uh, it's involved personnel from nine LCCs, and this webinar series, uh, which today's uh, webinar is the final of a series of six, uh, is the initial development of the products that the IDMN pro uh, promised. The IDMN project looked at ways to bring coherence to a rather fractionated information management landscape. Specifically, the project tried to address ways that LCC partners deal with basic building blocks of data management uh, building and sharing science products with partners, securely uh, storing those data for the long term, and evaluating ways to get those inputs to cooperators and eventually to the public. Over the course of the IDMN project, the scope was expanded to address ways to track projects that sponsored these specific uh, these scientific outputs, as well as build communication products and tools to help community members work better together. These efforts always kept other landscape level efforts in mind, especially the efforts of the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center and the, and the, regional, the network of regional climate science centers. The IDMN project assembled six teams of information management, natural resource, and communication specialists to evaluate and test different approaches. From this effort, the teams defined ways different LCCs and other landscape level projects could not just coexist, but constructively work together. The plan is to eventually move the whole uh, IDMN concept into a series of communities of practice, and we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the webinar uh, today. Uh, the, the IDMN project, of course, is winding down. It was a project that was funded for a specific time period, but the concepts and challenges of integrated data management will continue through these communities of practice. The integration pathways that the IDMN focused on uh, should focus on data sharing options and fostering data integration partnerships, including data sharing, facilitating use of uh, new integration options, collaborating on guidance documentation, and fostering hardware and software solutions for partnerships among the LCCs, the CSCs, and others. To get these int integration pathways started, the IDMN project generated a variety of products. These include metadata and data standards to help groups work together in specific domains, tools that let uh, projects take advantage of partner capabilities and collaboration concepts, culminating in a document we call a Roadmap to Interoperability. Uh, this document will be available uh, by the end of calendar year 2014. Uh, it is in, in uh, final editing stage right now, and it'll go out for peer review. Uh, but we will also be presenting a number of these materials, draft documentation and presentations at the Large Landscape Conference Workshop uh, or a large landscape conservation workshop in uh, Washington, D.C. in October. So as I mentioned, uh, we had a series of six webinars across the summer. Uh, if you haven't had the pleasure of viewing some of those early webinars and you would like to, uh, you can go to our the Landscape uh, Conservation Cooperative Network YouTube channel located at the URL that you see on the screen here. All of the webinars are recorded and they're also uh, transcripted by a transcript specialist so that the text is available as well. Today, the final uh, webinar in this series is titled Next Generation Data Integration Challenges. And along with myself, it will be presented by Jim Stritholt, who's with the Conservation Biology Institute, and Tim Kern from the USGS Fort Collins Science Center. So right now, I'll turn it over to Tim. And Tim, you have control. Thank you. Uh... As Sean pointed out, this is about the Integrated Data Management Network project. And through the course of this project, we discovered, you know, we, we, as Sean pointed out, we had several working groups. We put together, uh, groups put together surveys. We did evaluations of 
of different concepts. We implemented different uh, uh, pilot projects. We did a lot, and and through the course of it, we kind of you know there were a lot of discoveries from from people on all ends. Uh, for me, I think the biggest dis discovery was that debt integration. When I first went into this project, I just thought of it in terms of tech technology, and it, clearly it's not. Um, the, the the project pointed out pretty darn clearly that the the that debt integration is that interaction of people, policy, and technology. You can have the best IT, and you don't have the people behind you, and you don't have policy. Uh, it's not supported by policy. It goes nowhere. The, the landscape is littered with unused technologies because of the miss other missing components. So through the IDMN project, we really did, a, 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 I think, a pretty good effort in trying to round to put together that, that whole integration point of people, policy, and technology. We also found out, and I found out uh, especially, is, is that the local and community efforts really are, are as critical or more critical to the, to, the, to the conservation efforts as any national effort. National efforts are great. They give you an opportunity to, to uh, uh, build land, uh, data sets that span vast areas, to, to have tools that can serve a multitude of communities. But it, what it comes down to is that these local efforts are, are are just essential to get to have any meaning behind the, the, the data integration efforts. So let's just start with uh, you know what, what when we're talking about this. So when we're talking about next generation challenges, we've got to talk about what what is data integration. In, in the view of the the project, data integration was a new collection. Somebody's done a, an effort, a local effort, even a national effort. They've they've see, find uh, other data sources that would be complementary to this new collection. And they build a view, an analysis, a report, something that blends these different sources, that, that collection with these new data sources. The, the ob biggest obstacle that we've faced in the past and in the, in the present and going into the future is that these new collections get isolated. They aren't, they aren't, they aren't easily shared, or they're not documented well enough for anybody to trust them. They're not documented for anybody to use or they're not in, a, in an accessible location. That means when you finally put together your, your view or analysis, you're excluding what could be a pretty critical piece of information from the, from the big picture. Um, traditional methods, which, and when I say traditional methods, these, this, is, this is things that we still do now for a significant amount of our, our data integration work. We go to the literature, we find sources, we go to the, to the, to the uh, author, the principal investigator, request information from them. And this has been going on for a long time. It's, there's a, 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 a citation from Mesopotamian literature from 1500 BC, which basically gives you know instructions on how to get the data on on dragonflies. Um, the, this is this is the traditional solution. So the part of the IDMN project in the present was to look for ways to expedite this process. And, and get around some of the traditional obstacles, the roadblocks you have with just getting data direct from a, from a PI or getting it directly from a, from a project. Uh, those roadblocks include that your different mission, your, your data collector for different, mission, different missions often have mission-specific vocabularies, custom vocabularies. So there's no good crosswalk among different data sets to build that combined view. Uh, when you're dealing with a lot of different formats and types of data, uh, you, you really have a lot of problems with extraction, transform load, using those data. That ETL process gets, gets pretty extensive. Uh, you also have the problem with inconsistent spatial representation. Basically, different groups, different projects that have, different, that have spatial data and different representations, if they're poorly documented, if they're not quite, um, if there's some inconsistency in the representation, you, it'll really confuse visual, visualization efforts as well as analysis. You also have, when you're getting data directly from a source uh, without, where, where it's done for a different project, it may have a fairly complex schema. That makes it very difficult to pull out uh, project appropriate data, something you can use in your analysis. And again, the, the big bugaboo is inadequate metadata. Unclear provenance, uh, just a, not enough documentation on your data. It's not only makes it un, unusable in a spatial context, in a transform context, but it also makes it suspect. 
later users just may not want to deal with this because it's it's just not they didn't know exactly what the processing steps were and they don't feel comfortable they they nobody would feel comfortable using that in their analysis so with these next generation those are this generation challenges which will probably still continue into next generation we have through the efforts of the IDMN as well as some some uh, work from people associated with projects around the idea identified some areas where we can uh, at least address some of these issues and the first is providing support for community and regional efforts that, that that's critical many of these efforts feel feel isolated they, they have no way to share their data they're, they're confronted with some really ex potentially expensive technologies the start startup costs the the learning curve on on sharing their data is is sometimes well beyond the reach of a community effort. So one thing we found with the IDMN effort, IDMN project, was that providing support for this these community or regional or small project efforts is critical to making sure that they that we can um, share them and use them in landscape conservation. The second is establishing best practices and standards for for cooperating catalogs and repositories. So so you're going to have these groups that that work as as repositories for their projects their, that their data collections their metadata catalogs and making sure that they that they understand that working against standards uh, is is the only way they're really going to share their data their data is going to be found their data is going to be used so uh, what the IDMN project did look to establish best practices and standards on this uh, to establish connections across organizational bounds was is huge. Um, the USGS is 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 data is great. It's 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 got a it's it's got a far reach, but it benefits from having access to Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, NGO, university, other other data sources, and that's 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 critical. Where people have to look beyond their organizational silo for for the for connections to other data. Now that's more and more common these days but you still have some some issues with with these organizational bounds some agencies are a little loath to to build shares to their ways for people to share their data so we did would identify some of the issues associated with this and again following up on this not just data but tools and analysis methods that those, those are really critical if you see something that you like on a different site or, or a different project is using you're going to want to be able to see you know how did they do that what what did they use to to get that result and that means knowing having defined places for code code repositories for analysis tools for tool sheds these are these are critical to to making sure that you're moving ahead and head for for the next generation set of integration products and the last which is really critical is to get examples out of diff different integration techniques and approaches so people can evaluate what what else is out there uh, Projects tend to become fairly interstitial. They, they, you know, the, the, the adage, you never get what you need to get your developers know how to do, is, is real, it's true today as it was yesterday and will probably be true tomorrow. So having project coordinators, project participants look at, be able to look at different integration techniques, things used by different organizations are, is critical for them to, to not be uh, tied to a single model. So to, to talk about some of these ex examples of this, I'm going to turn this over to Jim Sturholz from Conservation Biology Institute. Thank you, Tim. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, well, as, as the other two uh, presenters uh, indicated, or we really wanted to not only develop guidelines and, and uh, best practices, but we actually wanted to test it and see in, with a real life example that we could learn a lot more from and making it very practical. And this whole test drive of interoperability was between a database, in which is a, a system that my organization has developed, and uh, ScienceBase, with, which from USGS. Um, and it was largely focused on maps, since conservation is often about place, although it's not exclusively maps, but that has been the primary focus. And I, I want to reiterate some of the comments that both Sean and Tim made is that we've been doing this a long time now. And yes, technology is important. Yes, data is important. But if you lose sight of the people, you will lose the, uh, the value of what you're trying to build. And we've encountered this many, many times over now. If we lose sight of who our audience is, 
and what we are trying to achieve, uh, we often will miss the mark in terms of any kind of technological solution we think we're going to bring to the table. The four basic pieces of database, and, and it really should be true for any interoperable system, are really four things. I think we have to spend a lot of effort to think about how do we improve access to data, whether it be spatial or otherwise. As you'll see in my comments that follow, I'm really trying to focus a lot on the topic of integration. What does that look like? How do you do that, uh, particularly with a lot of the uh, human and social political pieces? I mean, I'll have to tell you, over the years, it's far easier to fix a technical problem than it is a social one. And this is very much about social networks of people. Uh, the third one, it deals with usability. You need to find a way to make it usable for a broader group of people. Not everyone's going to be a GIS expert, nor should they have to be. Um, but a lot of people, most people actually, make spatially explicit decisions all the time. And so how do you bring this, in, this increased level of content type and depth to those people in a usable way? And the last one is really about collaboration. Again, it's not about a big data warehouse exclusively. It's how do people use it to solve real world problems and that's what we're trying to get after. Um, so in the case of the LCCs, we are actually in the process of either have launched or are building uh, to support 14 of the uh, 22 LCC networks with something that we're calling conservation planning atlases. And here's just a couple of examples of the ones that are already launched uh, and more are on the, in being developed as we speak. The, if I zoom into the southwestern United States, give you an example. So we have the North Pacific LCC uh, Conservation Planning Atlas has launched and it's fully operational. Uh, these uh, Southern Rockies is nearing launch, and the other three for Great Basin, Desert, and California are just underway of being developed. So they're using a database and front end to, um, to um, manage the communities around conservation design, planning, and decision making. Now certainly we provide some of the, the data storage for those efforts, but not very much. In some cases, for example, California LCC, they have other data handling managing partners that they have a long history with that need to be incorporated. So anytime you see the silos, you're thinking data storage. Um, a major one is science space for these initiatives, um, being a federal uh, repository who's very well managed. So certainly each of these LCCs work directly with science space to manage their federal storage of data or other things. Sometimes they'll put some on our storage. But the real key and what we were trying to explore throughout the IDMN project was how can database and in science space get hooked together in such a way to make it really easy for the people out in these different regions to get service that they need to make the best use of the technologies and the relationships that we have. So that's kind of a snapshot. So all of these are interconnected and they share commonality among them. Even though they each have their own uh, front end, their own presentation, because each region has its own special social construct and that needs to be honored in order for it to be effective. I wanted to show you just uh, one more exploration here because I think this is a, an additional mention. So. With database, we are building additional, we call them gateways or conservation planning atlases. It doesn't matter what we call them, but the, we're wheeling with state government for California Department of Water Resources, for example. There's one for the Desert Renewable uh, Energy Conservation Plan. Those are both state en entities. We are building one now for local government, in this case, Kern County as an example. We are building one for Fish and Wildlife Service Region 8 who has direct ties to science base for storage, but the front end, again, is a database and front end. And it can get pretty complicated looking with all of these interconnections, but I know this slide's very busy, but it's trying to uh, communicate that the beauty is that they all have their own identities, but they all have interconnections of the data that they need to do their work, and that's important. And it can be replicated. This is just an illustration, and it's a simple one because you didn't want to have the whole thing looking like spaghetti. Um, 
Now, over the last few years, I've been in many meetings, um, and there's lots of conversation uh, in Washington and other places. And one of those deals with, well, we have the federal government, and uh, we need to start connecting because we're too siloed. We have a lot of value, but it's all broken up into pieces. And, and Tim referred to this earlier in his remarks. Well, that that uh, that. that position where the federal government is trying to find ways to work together from the standpoint of data, that conversation is happening at the state level, and it's also happening to a certain degree at the local level. So people are recognizing the value of finding a way to keep their identities and their missions intact while finding creative new ways to share across them, because each of these entities have a piece of the solution to the problems that we face. So connecting the, the networks of networks becomes valuable, and it's a, it's a daunting task, but something that can be done. That's just government. There are many other people from NGOs, universities, corporations, and other businesses, even citizen science have a role to play to provide and to use the data that each of us creates and use in our daily uh, decision making. Now, my last few remarks, I, I want to just I'm going to focus in on this term integrate, and I'm going to use database as the example. But again, it it can it can apply to other platforms too. But this is the one I know the best, and so this is the one that I can feel most confident in describing some things. But there are there are some threads here that I think apply more generally. Well, one is there's always going to be new interpretation tools, and interpretation is key. It's one thing to to strangle the the data monster. You know, we have all these data. In fact, um, I have someone told me once, you know, you're dying in an avalanche of rose petals. It means you've got all the things you need, but you're still suffocating because you can't get your head around and, and get it managed in a reasonable way. So having a bunch of data isn't enough. We need to find ways to find it, to make it integrated into actual interpretation for people. Um, Whatever those tools are, here's a simple one we just launched, which is a new slider, which helps you visualize things in a different way to help you interpret. Integrating time, here's a quick series of fire in a certain portion of Southern California. Now, we have it for every year for 80 years. This is just a couple of examples. And it can be queryable and research and animated. It brings another dimension to understanding and interpretation. Another, another area that I think is going to be growing, because a lot of people are building websites to do lots of different things in the conservation space. Here's an example where we're, this is a project with the DRECP gateway that I showed you briefly in an earlier slide, where the landscape is broken up into pieces. Um, in this case, these are four kilometer grids. Anyone who goes to this particular layer clicks on a box and they have a series of records of the kinds of covered species that may be present in that location that indicates to a land manager or a potential developer that these are the species that may likely occur there and these are the ones that, that you are responsible for a management plan and certain requirements by law. Well, what does that have to do with integrating with other sites? There are ways to hot link this sort of system, which we've done with this example, to other sites. For example, you click on a hot link. If you didn't know anything about desert tortoises, you could go to the Encyclopedia of Life. This is a totally separate managed system all by itself with a simple link. You went from a map, an integrated mapping platform to obtaining additional information from a totally different place and together makes for a very powerful presentation and utility for the end user, in this case, a land manager or a potential developer or a regional or state planner. The integrating with different types of viewers, uh, there is a chapter in the IDMN uh, report that's due out here not too long in the future pertaining to visualization and different ways of visualizing. And having done a fair amount of research in it now, um, a viewer is a viewer is a viewer, and they're different and they're made to do different things. If you're a, a just visitor to different viewers, the, I think the tendency is to think that they're all kind of the same and they're really not. Here's an example of a viewer, for example, and I can't show you the dynamic nature of it because it's not live, this is a PowerPoint. 
But if you go to adaptwest.databasin.org, you can see this live. And the map and the chart is connected. So if you click on a section of the map, the, the chart will highlight in where you are. And in this case, we're exploring different climate change futures throughout North America, for example. Well, that's just the example. Now what we want to do is you take whatever you learned from this map, you would click on it and open up a different viewer and begin to integrate with other data. So you're interpreting complicated information to the end user while giving them the flexibility to integrate with something that allows them to control and to explore and to generate new products from it. That's going to be a wave of the future. In addition, there's going to be increasing numbers of specialized analytical tools that will sit on top of these different platforms. And in the case of the database and science-based integration, there's a tool here on the left margin where it says Site Assessment Tool. We've actually built the code now. We've, we've worked together as a team. And even though the data can live in different places, this analysis tool, which is pretty powerful but simple to use, getting back to the usability aspect, is that the user doesn't care where the data live. The user wants to be able to do some, some operation. And so we've lowered the barrier, the technical barrier, where they can access and run this tool on data that we provide as well as ScienceBase provides. And in the future, there will be multiple places where those data live in order to achieve the objective. And it's, we're not too far from having actual geoprocessing and display on the fly. Uh, we were having discussions with some supercomputing facilities. But again, it has to drive very smoothly for your end user, and you need to know who they are and what they need to do with this thing. You don't just build it and they come. You build it with a purpose in mind. But the beauty is that it's not the future is not going to be, here's just some static stuff we loaded. It's going to be, we're going to create new results on the fly, and it's going to be in the hands of the user, not a single researcher. That is a powerful development that's coming quickly. And my last slide deals with the integration of all of this with different devices. Um, there's been a lot of development around platforms uh, in terms of desktop over the years. And over the last oh, three to five years, you've seen an explosion in web apps and phone apps and tablets, and that's going to continue. So. As we're pushing a lot of uh, information over the web uh, to do all sorts of things, including all these analyses and complicated models, um, being able to hook up to other devices, both in terms of bringing in new data, for example, different sensors, telemetry, atmosphere, water chemistry, whatever, um, as well as retrieval of, of interpreted data becomes an important. Those are kind of the bookends of high development right now. Finding easier, better ways to get new data in and finding easier, better ways to get it out to people through a variety of different devices. And so that leads to the last topic of big data. And I've been to a bunch of conferences over the last two years, and that's the talk. Everybody's talking big data. And they're talking big data for a couple of reasons, um, because we're getting to the place where we have the capacity to handle large volumes of data in creative new ways. And I'm going to turn it over to Tim in just a second. But the, the, point, the last point I want to make before we, we launch into big data is I think we need to be careful as a community that big data is the future. It's important. There's challenges. I get it. But we can't ignore the small data because there's a lot of places, and I have tons of examples, where we are leapfrogging to focus only on big data at the expense of, well, small data, which really isn't that small. But it can't be neglected. There's still more work to be done there. So the big data, as it comes online, has a, a, a smooth way of integrating with some of the more traditional types of data that we're more accustomed to working with. And not to forget that, because if we do, It'll be at it, it'll be uh, we will be at a disadvantage in the not too distant future. So with that, I'll stop. I'll turn it back over to Tim, and thanks for the attention. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> and following up on Jim's last comment, um, big data, and this is just a follow-up discussion on big data. In conservation, we've noticed, especially in the LCC efforts, 
that while there are big data sets, the vast majority of data that we're dealing with are what we'll call mid-range data sets. So it's, you, you may have heard the expression, the fire hose of big data. In our world, it's sort of like a sprinkler system of big data, of, of data. There's chunks of data that are hard to deal with, hard to manage, but they come at you from all different directions and they're all different types. Some of these sprinklers are, are fairly tractable, we can deal with as long as we put resources toward them. Others are gonna take a little bit more time and effort. Uh, we, we sort of have to, we just can't focus on the fire hose. We have to, we have to take a look and start hunting down those, those sprinkler heads to make sure that we support all of our different groups. And that's again, Next generation, um, it, as Jim pointed out, every, you'll read tons of articles on big data and dealing with big data, but we're not Google. We're not dealing with Google level problems. In the conservation community, we have reasonably tractable problems. And while we do have an occasional uh, very large data set to deal with, it's not the majority use case in our, in our situation. So dealing with that uh, means that we can sort of focus on what what we can succeed with. Uh, just to, to refresh everybody, when you talk about big data, we're talking about something of a volume, a velocity, a variety, and a complexity that you really haven't seen before. So you don't have a real, you don't have an out of a box solution to deal with it. But it, it, whether it's big, mid, or little, you still have to support data management at different scales. So, that, so with big data, it's just a very different scale, but you still have to make sure you figure out a way to collect it, to store it, to process it, to visualize and distribute it, and then to archive it, to make sure that you have all the support tools in place for those data. So one of the things that we've been dealing with when we've encountered very large data sets, and I'll go back to Jim's example, is instead of trying to move lar very large data sets around, we move tools around. So in the case of the science-based database, database and integration, one of the things we, we did was make sure that we had compatible containers for these geoprocessing tools. So we worked against standards. We, we made sure that the, the systems could support the same tools. So rather than try to ship the entire data set from science base to data basin, we could do some geoprocessing on the science base side, deliver the results to data basin for further analysis, for visualization, for distribution turn it around, Data Basin has some very large data sets, is dealing, is dealing with a, some very large uh, uh, providers. And they've also, by, by providing geo uh, tools on their end, they're providing ways for people to get chunks of those data or subsets of the data or, or, or some sort of summarization of those data out to other portals for use. So again, creative approach to big data in conservation doesn't start with trying to build massive networks to move these data. It comes with you know, thinking outside the box, trying to come up with different ways to 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 share the results from those share results out of those data. So another issue that we have with in the big data arena, which is not as much big data as just lots of little data. So and that's data streams. We've had a lot of success recently with implementing some uh, containers, and this is on, on a variety of repository, we have some code shares on this, ways to handle data streaming in from uh, simultaneously from multiple sources. And this stems from some work that the, the, the USGS did with uh, Twitter social media feeds to, to try to capture that, that rapid rate of, of tweets to pull information out of, of those tweets and, and generate maps or alerts or something from that. So there's, there's been a lot of work on that end recently. And that is, again, something that, that uh, again, the IDMN project, uh, we're, we're seeing more and more need for, for things like this, whether it's from field sensors, as Jim pointed out, whether it's from social media, or whether it's just from uh, the, the rapid rate of, of, of uh, web services provided by other sources. So the, the concept of, one of the concepts that that the IDMN project for next generation use is looking at is just making sure that the toolkits that are built for these data streams are made available to other for, for partners or projects that want to that have the same same problem the same general efforts. Um, we also have to be aware of the fact that you know, 
back on still on big data is that you know data generation is increasing exponentially this doesn't necessarily apply to us the conservation community certainly not to just federal agencies in general in sp particular but we are seeing a massive an exponential increase in the amount of data being generated and we see that with um, we have leg with our legacy data the, if you look at the number of publications or published data sets from federal agencies over the course of years it's growing it's it's growing uh, dramatically um, conservation communities are supplying um, again because of the they're they're working in a digital realm more and more of these data become available there's also a lot more storage available and storage basically means that you're going to be you 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 can also cap uh, provide a lot more data so ease more readily uh, in 2014 basically there's they expect that the, the, the storage available is in the, going to be in the high exabyte range. And exabytes a lot. It's a billion gigabytes. And it, can, it may reach up into the zettabyte range. And that's, you know, again, that next step up, a trillion gigabytes. Um, in 2016, the, the projection is that the amount of storage available, which means the amount of potential sources available for conservation professionals to have to sift through, could be in the yottabyte range. Now, again, when we're talking about you know, yottabyte being uh, a trillion terabytes, so we're talking about this amount of data. Clearly, not all of this is stuff we're going to be dealing with in the conservation community. But we're going to be we're going to be marching along to the same drummer. We're going to, the the amount of data you the amount of uh, search results you get will increase dramatically just because a lot more people are working with. Uh, conservation data, more people are generating digital products. These digital products are now available, accessible to different people. And they're not simple. It, we've noticed that so many of the data sets that we're dealing with, they're not simple relational models anymore. They have unstructured text. They have media components. Um, right now, they, the, the, the idea is that in, in the world in general, 75% of generated data sets contain either unstructured text or media. We're finding of the, of the data sets that we're, we're capturing in, in just for the science-based project is that you know, we're talking about at least half of them do. So there, there's areas out there that um, we just have to be aware that we're going to have to deal with more complex data sets. One thing that we are dealing with in the conservation community are basically um, interim products from models. Modelers generally regulate a terabyte or more of data for a run for a model run. This is climatological, hydrologic, even you know, state transition models from ecological modelers. These things are huge, and these interim data sets are critical to to make sure that we have some level of capture on, so that we can recreate these model runs in the event that there's some question of provenance or or work through. Metadata can get you so far. There's going to be points where you're going to have a, a need for these interim products. So we're going to have to deal with this, how to capture this, these terabytes and terabytes, and then maybe more, maybe tens or hundreds of terabytes of data over the next few years. So just this leads right into the, 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 the general concept of federal agency challenge. Now, not everybody on the call is from a federal agency, agency, but a lot of people are, just looking at the list of people on the call. And federal agencies or NGOs or universities we have similar issues, uh, state, local communities, same things. The big ones are inadequate infrastructure. We're generating a lot of data. We're generating a, a lot of information. We need to find this. We just don't have the places right now, while there's a great, great huge increase in storage in the world, uh, uh, we need to figure out how we're going to handle this stuff, how we're going to handle it. Our networks are uh, need upgrade. We have a staff skill mismatch. We have some very talented staff, staff working on these challenges, whether they're social, whether they're technical, whether they're policy. But as technology changes, as user expectations change, as the data changes, we're finding that our staff doesn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily trained in this type of work. Uh, I'll use the example. Jim showed some very, very uh, cool, if you go to database, you'll see some very cool efforts they use some pretty complex JavaScript libraries to generate this stuff. That stuff doesn't that that, that skill didn't exist five years ago to, to work with that. And the next generation of tools that Jim 
or groups of the, that, that other groups work with, we'll, won't, that we're going to be using three issues that probably don't exist today. So it's going to be hard to keep up with that. Resource limitations. That's not a surprise to anybody. Every, we see our budgets flat or decreasing. Our expectations grow higher, but our resources don't. Uh, federal and department policy sometimes works against us, uh, trying to share data, trying to share um, efforts, even to the point of getting some training. Um, and then the final real challenge is user expectations. As, as our scientists, as our researchers, as our, as our audience for integration activities grow more used to um, the, 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 the tools that are out there in the field, they expect our system whether it's our NGOs, whether it's our federal systems, to behave the same. And, and that's sometimes unrealistic. The budgets, looking at the ones above between policy, resources, skills, and infrastructure. We just haven't, don't have it to, to support them. But just because we have these challenges doesn't mean we don't have approaches to them. So one of the things that we looked at in IDMN was just looking at, you know, what are our options outside of, you know, the, the you know, instead of just throwing up our hands and looking for Lauren, what can we do? So some good news on the infrastructure front. There, we do have commercial and government clouds pretty readily available. Database and runs on a, an Amazon cloud, I believe. Uh, ScienceBase has a, a fairly significant uh, uh, com cloud in, uh, presence. We're seeing more and more uh, availability of commercial, of, of these cloud infrastructure efforts. That means we don't have to uh, house it ourselves or buy it or maintain it ourselves. So, and it, it also provides much more robust networks for external users. So you're, you're, not, you're not constantly trying to upgrade your network to conform to the next generation of expectations. There's also this movement for open compute cluster access. So if, right now, modelers with, within uh, some of the LCC projects are using some of these compute cluster access routes. These are, these are um, either free or, or you know, nominally free, you know, some some minor cost to to basically get some your hands on some pretty significant compute cluster compute clusters. Uh, this this is something that's that's brand new. In the old days, these are closed down to to very big projects. They're they're opened up now to to a variety of groups, to smaller groups, to community groups, and clearly to the partners in the LCC. Staff skill set mismatch, big issue. Training budgets are gone. You're basically hosed if you think you're going to train your staff. So we have to, again, look outside. One thing that the USGS has done recently is tied, on, tied into MOOCs, massively open online courses. Uh, USGS staff have worked with Stanford and MIT to develop some of these, that some of these courses that Stanford and some of these other universities are, 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 have developed for state-of-the-art tool set training or classes are, are open to, to some of these agencies. So, so tying on to these MOOCs is a great way to make sure that your staff stays current in their skills. They're either free or extremely nominal cost, and they're, they're done online. You can do it at your own pace. You can work around the, your schedule on these things. And another big one is, and this is what the IDMN has really pushed, is a community of interest. Communities of interest are critical to staying up to date on skills, whether it's data stewardship, whether it's JavaScript or, or technical uh, programming, uh, you know, whether Python, GIS, and staying abreast of policy changes. You remember we said at the very beginning, this is people, policy, and technology. We have communities of interest for all of these. And it's not just the LCCs. The uh, Community for Data Integration, again, many of you who work with the LCCs, work with the Community for Data Integration, interagency, inter, uh, educational and NGOs belong as well, provide a number of communities of interest where you can stay current on what's going on in a particular domain. Resources. Okay, so the government's broke, we know it. We're not gonna get any more money. It's, it's we're doomed. Uh, well, one thing we can do is look for more open source projects. Uh, there's a lot of really cool ones out there that can really cut the cost of tool development. That that's this that's huge to to make sure that you have cost efficient, um, you know, not resource sucking uh, software projects. You, know, you still need developer. You still need number two. You still need staff to implement it. But at least you can start 
you don't have to start from the ground up. You can start somewhere midway. There's also a lot of free or low-cost collaboration sites. I throw out Griffin Groups has, has opened up a, a lot of efforts, a, a lot of collaboration tools to the LCC communities. Yes, there's, there's uh, agreements that have to be handled. But again, these, these are nothing compared to having to purchase and set up your own database. And it works with, with uh, community uh, portals. And again, the, the cost relative to trying to, to, to uh, set this up yourself is, is huge. If you're in a, in a federal agency or the Department of Interior, uh, there's also all sorts of tools to, that you can use that can get your project going. Again, not, not eating up all of your budget just to build the software component. You still have to fund the people. You still have to have people who can work with this stuff. But at least it cuts some of the cost and lessens some of the the burden on your resource allocation. Other opportunities, policy. Policy can drive people crazy. You know, what what are we supposed to? You know, how can we share data if we have limitations? What are our security policies? What are our records retention policies, etc. Some of these policies were written in the 60s and never got updated, and that really just drives you crazy. That can drive you crazy. One thing that's an opportunity. Now we have a fairly significant retirement rate in in the federal service. That means we're going to be losing people with a huge amount of domain knowledge, but it also means that we're, all, we're going to be opening up position, management positions to people who may have a different view of policy. And now would be the time to make sure we get in front of those people to, to try to affect some change. And we see this at the federal level. As, as at the federal level, the Project Open Data and, and some of the efforts that the GSA and, and um, Office of Management and Budget have put together really open up our they're they're playing right into our data sharing data access and and metadata uh, uh cataloging efforts uh this is this is a good thing we're also seeing uh, uh because you know, part part of it is because of lower lessened resources we're seeing that the government in general is doing having an increased reliance on external sources for policy directives they're looking at industry they're looking at groups that are that have already experimented on on opening up data opening up uh, access routes and they're starting to, to to copy what they've done and that's again very good news for people who are trying to integrate data going forward that will probably see fewer and fewer federal roadblocks to data sharing data access collaboration and even the types of things that database and the science basin did which was tool sharing the last item well, user expectations, you're kind of hosed if you don't have that infrastructure, the staff to support the, the infrastructure, and a, a policy to, to share data. But, but assuming those do come along, the next great opportunity we're seeing is more and more groups using agile project development. And that's where they're involving scientists, and not just techies, in tool development, in database development. And that's where projects get developed on, on very short cycles. So that a user who, who's got a, a particular, see something, has a particular expectation, may be able to get their input in and have it affected on in a fairly rapid time frame. Uh, nothing like the two-year cycle we see with traditional waterfall projects. Again, infrastructure availability, we're seeing more and more uh, infrastructure, especially network infrastructure, being presented uh, to at low lower lower and lower cost of federal agencies, and again that will make the user experience just that much better. Uh, waiting for a page, waiting for a tool to to complete, probably not as not as bad now as it was a few years ago, years ago, and certainly will be better in the next few years. And again, the last item is more ready to use toolkits are available. We're seeing a lot of software projects following up on that open source comment that are just ready to plug in and go. Um, if you're working with gridded time series data, you, you, you just it's, you work with threads. It's done for you. Um, it's, there's all sorts of different tools that are just out there ready to use that can really make the user's um, expectation, that, that you can meet user expectations fa faster and better than we ever could in the past. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean. 
thanks, Tim and Jim, for providing some really good background, both on some specific uh, issues uh, that we deal with now and, and uh, some of the overriding issues that we're going to be dealing with in the future. I, I want to bring us back as I finish up here uh, a little bit back towards the IDMN and the things that we did and how we addressed it and, and how, what we expect to see going forward here to sort of take a little bit of a, a, a temporal, uh, uh, you know, approach to what information and data management means. You know, one of the common themes in, in conservation science, uh, you know, this is true for the LCCs and it's also true for the IDMN, is a lot of times we're dealing with some things that are static, you know, things like a satellite image that's sort of a, a one picture in a moving film, you know, just like a, a GIS map or a computer, computer model. They have a certain amount of staticism and we all recognize that that snapshot isn't you know, isn't an accurate depiction of, of, of the, the world that we're living in. Uh, you know, and it's sort of like uh, uh, trying to jump on a moving carousel. And so to be uh, on an LCC or to be, uh, you know, part of this IDMN, you have to be a little bit of a rule breaker uh, because, uh, you know, the carousel is not going to stop for us. And, and when you get on, you have to be able to look backwards from where that, uh, you know, where that horse came from and, and also be prepared to ride it into the future. And so, uh, as we um, move the slides here along, you know, we kind of kept that in mind here. And, and so the products that we delivered and that we are delivering for the IDMN, you know, they, they, cert, they have to have sort of a date stamp on them because it is a project and we're only working within a certain time frame here. Uh, but we, but we kind of tried to recognize, we took the information that we had not only from the past, but also from other sort of sectors of information management things like energy and, you know, healthcare and things like that and, and deliver them right now as, as sort of a signpost on that carousel moving along uh, with the intention that it's not a stop sign, but maybe just a yield uh, or, or maybe not even that. But uh, we had a project, project tracking team deliver these strategies and tools. Uh, we had some very uh, high quality recommendations, as Jim mentioned, for visualization of var various kinds of digital data resources. And then the tool shed, which I think, uh, you know, Tim alluded to a lot, the fact that, uh, you know, there is a lot more open opportunity to get uh, uh, software and to use it and to modify it through open standards and whatnot. And uh, that's what the tool shed team spent a lot of time working on. Uh, also, uh, the user training and outreach, these are all chapters that are in this roadmap to interoperability and they kind of approach this sort of higher level, uh, you know, uh, approach to integrated data management. Uh, but we also got our hands dirty with things like uh, the full integration of science base and database and that Tim and, and Jim talked about, uh, the tool shed uh, that I mentioned here and we'll mention again in just a minute. And then the LCC-wide integrated project tracking mechanism, which is very highly adapted and also integrated so it can function very well for individual LCCs, uh, but also linked to that national LCC network as well as the climate science centers. And it has the kind of generality that anyone can take a, a, a piece of that project tracking infrastructure and apply it to any particular, uh, you know, tracking that they're looking at. Uh, all these products are going to be delivered at lccnetwork.org, as I said, by the end of the calendar year. And I'll give you a couple of examples, uh, sort of as this temporal perspective here, uh, starting from a look backwards, uh, then talking about uh, very contemporary problems and then how the IDMN sets up the LCC network into the future. And sort of the, the backward look here, and I don't mean to say that, you know, this, this particular project, uh, you know, is, is backwards or anything, but the point is, is that uh, pallet sturgeon is a good example of a problem that we've been trying to work on for years. And uh, pallet sturgeon range from, uh, you know, the three forks of the, of the Missouri way up in the Missouri headwaters all the way down to the Gulf. And there's all kinds of threats and stresses that are that the pallet sturgeon need to deal with and the managers need to deal with as well. well one of them is contaminants. And all, uh, throughout the range of the pallet sturgeon in the Mississippi and Missouri River systems, uh, there's various elements of contaminants. They're different in different regions. And, and, you know, before we had LCCs and before we had this concept of integrating our data networks, uh, we were sort of dealing with them in these chunks that weren't necessarily flowed together. Uh, but uh, through some of the guidance that we got from the IDMN, uh, especially the IDMN visualization team, and quality communication between natural resource managers and a developer, specifically Matt Heller, uh, who works with the Great Northern LCC, we developed a web application to deal with that. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but uh, just recognize that uh, by pulling data resources from multiple organizations here, 
and making them available in a single mapper, uh, Matt and, and partners developed a tool that's relevant to seven LCCs, and now they can start talking about contaminant issues across a much larger geography. And as you might imagine, uh, you can start to expand this data set to include some of the other threats that pallet sturgeon and, and, the, uh, and the professionals that manage for pallet sturgeon uh, need to deal with. And the problem existed beforehand, but uh, you know, the, the concept of integrated data management brought, brought it to a, a tool that uh, can be useful now going forward. Um, speaking more towards the, uh, the present, uh, just in the last year and a half, well, as many as you, uh, of you know, the, uh, the greater sage grouse has been uh, a conservation uh, challenge for uh, decades or more now. Uh, but the, in 2015, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is, uh, will be uh, making a listing determination on the species. And one of the things that uh, have always vexed the sage grouse or, and, and sage grouse managers in understanding the conservation status and trend in sage grouse is that they cover a very large geography. There are a huge number of organizations that have responsibility for managing some element of uh, sage grouse, uh, you know, habitat and uh, life history needs. And it was very difficult to try and get these pieces of data together. So working through uh, the LCC network, through some funding that was delivered through the National uh, Network Office, and uh, multiple LCCs contributing to uh, groups with both with Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Geological Survey, we developed the Conservation Efforts Database, which at heart is very much a project tracking challenge. And so some of the information that was developed for the project tracking element of IDMN was brought to bear. Uh, it is also very much uh, uh, an integrated tool uh, development mechanism. And so the things that we learned from the Toolshed team were employed for to develop the conservation efforts database. And of course, when you're talking about multiple agencies uh, from you know, federal, state, local, NGO uh, uh, levels here, uh, the, the uh, kinds of outreach and training that you need uh, can be tremendous. And, I'm not going to go into much detail about what uh, the uh, conservation efforts database does, but recognize that there's lots of different ways to input data. Uh, it has a very powerful back-end data management infrastructure. Uh, it has security functions so that data is only shared when, uh, when uh, the individual who entered the data is ready to share it. It has an uh, internal QA, QC process and it has integrated, an integrated analysis environment so that the data is readily usable. Uh, and uh, the, all of the uh, operations, both the data input, output, and the QA, QC process are managed through these web services. So it essentially takes advantage of, you know, the next generation of uh, information data management. So that's sort of the, the challenge of today uh, is that we're working with sage grouse here, uh, but moving kind of the concept into the future is that the conservation efforts database was left at, uh, programmatically anyway, was left at a generic enough level uh, that the, the tool is useful for any kind of species conservation effort, listing decision or otherwise, and uh, you can just repopulate the database with some other data and, and uh, you know, begin to use it as a more sort of generalized conservation management tool, a conservation data management tool. And then finally, uh, uh, speaking to being ready for the future, uh, I want to quickly mention the Climate Resilience Toolkit that is uh, being developed by the Council of Environmental Quality. Uh, this is uh, still in development. Uh, we, uh, the Council of Environmental Quality reached out to the LCC network uh, just in the last month or so and indicated to us that they were going to build this uh, uh, climate resilience toolkit, uh, which has both uh, geospatial, uh, you know, mapping capabilities, uh, and it also has some uh, um, information uh, uh, you know, sort of data mining type approaches that sort of what, like what Jim was mentioning earlier. And they, uh, the Council of Environmental Quality asked the LCC, so do you have data that might be useful for us? And really, if the data is going to be useful, we want to see it delivered at various kinds of map services so that we can ingest it right into our mapper. And of course, because of uh, the LCC network and, and the IDMN, we were ready and poised to do that. Now, I can't say that we're uh, right now, uh, you know, fully prepared for what the future is going to bring us. But this is an example by having the community together, having the conversation already in place, and having things like the roadmap to interoperability, we were poised for this challenge. The question is, is will we be poised for the next challenge? Some of the things that Tim mentioned earlier. 
And in that case, the, the, the way that we pretend to do this, or the way that we intend to do it, I guess is the better way to put it, is to have these community of practices in place. Now, the IDMN is a project, as I mentioned, which means it sunsets. You know, our, the funding that was available for the IDMN uh, runs out at the end of this calendar year. Uh, we produced um, some, you know, of the roadmap for interoperability and the, and the tool shed and all, uh, several other pro products. Uh, but those products are no good if they stand alone in, in space and time. We need to be adaptable. We need to be ready for the next conservation challenge of the future. And the way we intend to do that is by taking advantage of, and in, in some cases where it's needed, to set up uh, these communities of practice. You know, as Tim and Jim mentioned, you know, we can't afford to lose any of the capacity. Everything that we've had, the, the, the many times that the carousel has spun around before right now, uh, it, we're all important, and we need to make sure that we uh, maintain that capacity and everything that we've already accomplished needs to be uh, brought forward to the future, especially the, the most valuable things. Uh, Tim mentioned the budgets are tight and, and the challenges are amplified. The LCC network uh, uh, strives to be a holistic, collaborative, and adaptive process that's grounded in science, and our data management network uh, must be too. And data is the currency of science. and and data is what we, what we might consider a trust resource. You know, if um, Joel Reynolds or Emily Silverman are out there, uh, they know what I'm talking about. Uh, you need to speak to, the, speak to the language of your partners so that they value the data as much as we as, uh, as data professionals do. So just to give you a couple examples of the communities of practice that are already in place, and uh, listen to Tim, I've, I realized I forgot uh, an important one here. Uh, but the LCC Data Management Working Group is a group of uh, uh, various kinds of uh, professionals working in partnership with the LCC that have been meeting and developing standards uh, for LCC uh, practices for uh, probably on the order of three years now. And that working group is an open forum and anyone's welcome to join uh, that uh, Confluence site that you see there. I think is password protected, but you can quickly get onto Confluence by setting yourself up an account. Just go to that website, or you can contact me, and I'll, I'll help you uh, get, get into the uh, data management working group. Also, the tool shed, which is hosted by Griffin Groups there, and you see those are the next two things listed. Uh, the tool shed uh, is a specific product of the IDMN, and it's a concept where we have a catalog of various kinds of decision support and uh, analysis tools, data analysis tools, uh, that people can go on and take a look at and evaluate it. In most cases, those tools are open source, and the additional value of the tool shed is there's also sort of this dynamic conversation that happens through a wiki such that uh, both developers and managers and researchers are all involved in that wiki. And so if you find a tool maybe that's pretty close to what you need but not quite, uh, you'll be able to contact the developer through that tool shed and generate that conversation about how do we take this open source uh, decision support tool or what have you, and make minor adjustments, kind of how Tim was uh, uh, indicating, uh, to, to, to get something that's a little more, more customized for my, my, you know, particular conservation problem. And of course, that extends to, uh, you, you know, you return that customized tool back to the tool shed, and then the next person who comes along has an opportunity to use that tool as well. Uh, Griffin Groups has a number of different uh, uh, communities uh, of those sorts. Uh, all kinds of things, not just data management, but all kinds of conservation and natural resource issues. And as Jim and Tim mentioned, uh, Data Basin is essentially set up as groups of communities of practices. Uh, in some cases, they have very specific uh, uh, objectives, but also there's a lot of commonality among groups, and there's the ability to link these groups and build that information infrastructure uh, among the groups. And, and the one that uh, Tim mentioned that I forgot there is the uh, uh, community for Data Integration. It's led by USGS, but again, it's an open forum to discuss and improve about our data uh, management and data delivery mechanisms. So if that wasn't enough information for you, I think we might have a few minutes for questions here, and I'm going to uh, pass it back over to Shana. And uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, I thank Jim and Tim for uh, their contributions. I thank the entire IDMN network and the 50 plus professionals that contributed to IDMN. And uh, thank you, Shana, for helping us uh, spread the word today. No problem. And thanks to all three of our presenters for their um, presentations. And as John said, we'll be now opening up the conference for your questions. Any questions for our panelists today? Well, this is Sean. Probably one thing I mentioned it earlier, but I'll reiterate. Uh, 
the, uh, the large landscape uh, conservation workshop that will occur towards the end of December in Washington, D.C. Uh, obviously, we'll have a number of uh, uh, specific symposia. One of them will be specifically towards the ID, IDMN, the Integrated Data Management Network, and uh, that will include an opportunity for additional discussion. So uh, anyone who plans to attend, or if you don't, I encourage you to come and, and join us at that workshop, and uh, let's continue the conversation there. No, it doesn't look like we have any questions for you guys. So must have been a, a thorough and informative presentation. So thank you for that. So with no questions, um, I'll go ahead and close it out. A recording of this broadcast will be posted on the Landscape Next Network's YouTube channel, and I went ahead and chatted that link in there. So you can view the recording of this broadcast as all, well as the recording of the previous webinars in this mini-series. Uh, thank you again to, for everyone for attending and enjoy the rest of your day.